Hello again, and welcome to A Little Book Open here on Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Pastor John Anderson. We're continuing our study in the wonderful book of Daniel. That is the little book open that we're studying. We've been spending quite a bit of time in the first chapter noticing Satan's methods of attack. And the Bible tells us that we should not be ignorant of his devices. Uh, we've gone through 10 different uh, strategies that we find in that chapter that uh, the devil used against God's people in that setting. He besieged and, and battered and went through various things, changed their diet, changed their names, and so on. It's time now to look at God's plan. Because as much as the Satan, as Satan devises and plans, uh, God has a better plan. And God knows and loves every single one of us. You know, in the first chapter of John, there's an interesting story. It has to do with the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And he's just becoming acquainted with some of those that are going to become his disciples, his apostles. And one of the individuals, his name is Nathaniel. And if you think about the name, it means God, my God has given. Beautiful name. And uh, he's going to be introduced to Nathaniel by Andrew and his colleagues. And Nathaniel at first is a little bit of a skeptic. He hears that Jesus is from Nazareth and he's not sure that that uh, is possible that any good thing can come out of, Na out of Nazareth. But Jesus gives him words of reassurance. He's, he told Nathaniel that I saw you when you were praying under the fig tree. Now Nathaniel was a devout believer and he was looking for the prophecies to be fulfilled. He was seeking for the coming of the Messiah. And he had spent some time alone under a fig tree earlier that morning. That is, he thought he was alone. He thought he was in solitude and nobody saw. But Jesus said, I saw you praying under the fig tree. And that impressed Nathaniel because he knew then that this was, this was the Messiah. The truth is that Jesus knows every one of us. And he knows every one of us, even before we were born, he knew of, he knew of us. In the first chapter of Jeremiah, there's a beautiful uh, story that pertains to the calling of uh, Jeremiah, who was to serve as a prophet. And it says here in Jeremiah chapter 1, I'm reading verse 5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And what was said of Jeremiah uh, could be said about every one of us. The Lord knows us. The Lord knows you. The Lord knows your name, where you live, what your circumstances are, and he has designs for good for you. He wants you to be a part of his kingdom. He wants you to live with him in that, in that kingdom that will, that will exist throughout eternity. To live with him in a body that's free of disease and pain and suffering and all of the trials and uh, assaults that the devil has brought against us in this life, that's the, the Lord's plan for you. So even though Satan has a plan and he's targeted you, he's targeted me, he's put a bullseye on our back, the Lord has a plan. And his plan is one that will result in our salvation and our eternal well-being. So we want to take a close, close look at God's plan. Every part of this plan that we're looking at that is demonstrated, brought to view in the life story of Daniel and his friends, applies in a spiritual way to you and to me. I hope you can see it that way as we study it. So there are 10 parts to the plan. Four of those parts, the first four, uh, we'll find as we read verses 3 and 4 of Daniel 1. So if you have your Bible open, we're looking at Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. We're going to see in these verses four different things that we can interpret, we can understand as being part of God's plan for us says, the, the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants, some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. So those four terms we're going to take a careful look at. What are they again? Noble birth, king's descendants, that's number one. No blemish, good looking, gifted in all wisdom. We're going to be looking at those terms. Of course, they applied in a literal way to Daniel and his friends. But we're looking at them from a spiritual point of view and how they are part of God's plan for you and me to be rescued out of Babylon and be made part of his kingdom. 
So that's our purpose. So we're going to take a look at these 10 points, these 10 different parts to God's plan. And we're going to see that the first one, in this one we see that he saves us. In points 2 through 9 that we'll undertake successively, in those 8, numbers 2 through 9, we're going to see how God changes us. Number one, he saves us. Secondly, he changes us. And last, point number 10, he equips us. So this is how we take a look at these 10 different parts of God's plan. He saves us, he changes us, and he equips us. In the first part, we can see the regeneration of the Spirit. That's how he saves us. In the second part, numbers 2 through 9, we see the fruits of the Spirit. And in the third part, we see the gifts of the Spirit. Of the Spirit, So it's all worked out uh, through the, the um, endeavors of the Holy Spirit in our life. He saves us, he changes us, he equips us. We can see that, that first part, uh, we, could, we could find the Bible word uh, impute in that. He imputes righteousness to us. In part number two, he imparts righteousness to us. And in part number three, he distributes righteousness to us through us. So this is how we're going to look at this 10-part plan, this marvelous, beautiful, symmetrical plan that God has in place to save us from this wicked world uh, and make us useful now and uh, a blessing through eternity. The first part, again, is how he saves us, and that's through the regeneration of the Spirit, and it involves how he imparts righteousness to us. And where does that come from? It comes from that term that we see that was in verse 3 there, so the Bible tells us that Daniel and his friends enjoyed a noble birth. They were king's descendants. They were king's children. Now, Daniel and his friends, it could have been, if things were different, if Babylon had never attacked, it might have been that Daniel would have served as one of the kings of, of Judah. That's a possibility. He had the right lineage. He was part of the king's descendants in the literal sense. Now, what we're looking at, of course, is how this term applies to us in a spiritual sense. There's a great interest today in genealogy. And uh, sometimes just from the point of view of curiosity, people want to find out what their family tree looks like. And so they spend some money and uh, uh, research is done and they possibly find out that uh, somebody of nobility or of importance uh, was uh, one of the branches on their family tree. Maybe somebody that was... Uh, uh, Ignominious, some, some notorious criminal could have been. I remember hearing about somebody that did this research. They found out one of their ancestors was a signer to the Declaration of Independence. So it's a, a, a curiosity to find out our genealogy. Now, also today, there's interest from this uh, matter in, in researching DNA to track down criminals who haven't been apprehended. So we have a lot of interest in that science today. We're looking at this from a spiritual point of view. What does it mean to be a descendant of the king? What does it mean in the spiritual sense to be of noble birth? Well, when we think about the birth that this is talking about, of course, we're talking about the new birth by which God brings us into his kingdom. You see, it doesn't matter what our physical ancestry might be. I might be from this country. You might be from that country. I might have that heritage. You might have that heritage. What matters most of all, though, is our spiritual family tree, our spiritual ancestry. And through the blessings of the gospel, every single one of us can be a son, a daughter of God. We can be a descendant of the king. Daniel and his friends were of noble birth in the literal sense, but thinking about that as it applies to us today, we can be children of the king by being adopted into the family of Christ. What an incredible blessing that is. What does the Bible say? Let's look at some Bible verses that bring this to view. We're going to look, first of all, in the uh, book of John, chapter 1. John, chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 12 and 13. John, chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. As many as received him. Maybe we should put it on pause for just a second. What does it mean to receive Christ? Maybe somebody doesn't know what that means. It simply means to open your heart and ask Jesus to come in. It means that you get down on your knees in the morning when you have your morning devotion, your morning prayer, and you say, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Control my, 
will, my desires, my thoughts. That's what it means to receive him. As many as received him, as simple as that is, so many people have never done it. They have never actually received Christ. They may know a lot about the Bible. They may go to church and sit in a pew, but have they received Christ as their personal Savior? Have they given their heart to Jesus? That's the important thing. That's what it's talking about here. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, to be born of God. Well, what is this talking about? It's a, a spiritual illustration that the Bible uses. Jesus talked about it when he had an interview with Nicodemus. We find this in the third chapter of the book of John. Nicodemus was a high-ranking teacher, instructor in, in Judea. He was known to be the expert in the writings of the scriptures and so on. And yet when he spoke with Jesus, it was almost as if he was ignorant, completely ignorant of this matter. He came to Jesus by night. He was a little apprehensive to let his appearance be known to everyone. But he came to him and he had a conversation. And he began by some platitudes, some uh, uh, good words, some flattery. We know that you must be God, a teacher from God. Nobody can do these signs unless God is with him. And Jesus stopped him abruptly. And he knew Nicodemus's heart. And he knew that although he had a lot of knowledge in his head, he had not yet received salvation through Christ. And so Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Oh, how this must have shocked the ears of Nicodemus. He thought he was going to come there and butter Jesus up with some nice words. And Jesus said, wait a minute. Unless you're born again, you have no part of this. Even though Nicodemus had all the credentials, the diplomas, all the letters after his name, Jesus said, that isn't what matters. Have you been born again? That's a question that we need to ask ourselves too. Have we been converted? Have we given our life to Christ? Have we received him in the same sense? Well, Nicodemus uh, wasn't sure what that meant. And so he began to ask some questions. He says, uh, what does this mean? Do I have to uh, enter again into my mother's womb and be born again? He did not understand the spiritual significance of that term. It means a renewal. It means a new beginning. It means that the Holy Spirit comes and changes us from within and changes our way of thinking so that we have different thoughts that are in accordance with the principles of the Holy Bible. And this is something that is an absolute necessity for us to be part of God's family. But it's a great privilege and it's easy to be done. We receive him. We ask Jesus to be part of our lives. We surrender our will to him. And that gives, the Bible says, that gives to us the right, the right, the authority to, to know that we are children of God. We are of noble birth. Not in the sense that Daniel and his friends were. That was in a literal, physical way. No, we are in a much more important way of noble birth. We are king's descendants. We are sons and daughters of God when we receive Christ and we let the Holy Spirit come in and convert us. Let's look at a couple other verses that deal with this. I'm looking now in the writings of John in his letters. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. He said, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Now, that's an interesting expression. In other words, John is saying, I can't put into words to explain this. All I can do is ask you to look at it. Behold. Examine it. See for yourself. Behold, what kind of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Us? What is us? That's you and me. That's, we're faulty, failing sinners. We've made a miserable mess of our lives. And yet when we receive Christ, when we experience that new birth, that noble birth, then we become children of God. What manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God, sons and daughters of the King. What a beautiful promise. Now, Paul wrote also on this, reading from uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Paul says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, that's just another way of expressing this matter of opening our heart to, to God, ask Jesus coming in, surrendering our will to him. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. You are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And there are many other verses that uh, are in the Bible that express this idea. So the, the beautiful thing is that even though we've made many, many mistakes in our life, today, this moment, 
we can give our lives to Christ. We can ask Jesus to come in. We can ask the Holy Spirit to control our thoughts and our actions. And we are declared to be righteous. Christ's righteousness is imputed to us instantly. The Bible calls that justification. Somebody explained it this way. They said the word justification, that just means just as if I had never sinned. And they were exactly right. Because when God looks at us, he doesn't see our mistakes. He sees the perfect unblemished life and righteousness of Jesus. And in Christ, we are saved at that moment. We are of noble birth. We are king's sons and daughters. Even though we have nothing to offer God. What does the Bible say our righteousnesses are like? And by the way, if you look at that verse in Isaiah 64, verse 6, uh, whenever I type that, that verse into my computer, um, the, the word becomes colored or highlighted in some way, trying to tell me that it's misspelled. Because the Bible says all of our righteousnesses, and the computer doesn't know that word. It thinks it should be righteousness or something else, but it doesn't know the word righteousnesses. What the Bible is trying to say is that the total accumulation, the sum total of all of our good deeds, all of our righteousnesses are what? They're as filthy rags. That's all we have to offer God. It makes no sense to try to, to uh, present our good deeds before him as if there's something that could merit his favor, his love, his forgiveness. Impossible. But praise God through the gospel, through the good news that Jesus has revealed to us. We don't have to do that. All we have to do is come to him. Remember the story of the prodigal son? He wasted his father's substance in uh, foolish living. It says that he came to himself while he was feeding the pigs, those, those husks. And, he, and he, he realized that the hired servants that were back at home working for his dad were better off than he was. So he said, I'll go there and I'll present myself and I'll say, make me as one of your hired servants. But what, what happened in that story recorded in Luke uh, chapter 15? The, it says the father saw him afar off as if the father had been waiting out there every day, straining his eyes, looking to see the silhouette of his son on that road. And the day came, there he was, he was coming home in his rags, in his filth, in his stench. What did the father say? Go home, take a shower, and then maybe we can talk. Get some new clothes, and uh, then maybe we'll have a conversation. No. The father embraced him. said, my son was lost. He's returned. He was dead. He's alive. Bring forth the best robe. Put a ring on his finger. He was accepted at that very moment, despite all of his mistakes and bad, bad decisions. That's, that's, that prodigal son in that story represents me, represents you. It's... The gospel is embedded in that story of Daniel when it says that the ones that were chosen were of noble birth. They were king's descendants because that's, that's the future that God has for each one of us. If we will surrender to him and give ourselves to him and receive him, we become king's descendants at that moment. I hope that you've had that experience. If you've not had that experience, I appeal to you right now to open your life to God. Just say that simple prayer. Lord, come into my life. Change me. Save me. I recognize I have nothing to give to you except my, my failures, my need. But Jesus will become your Savior and your Lord and your King. And you will be adopted into the royal family at that instant. And you will be recorded. Your name will be written down in the book of life as one that is saved. What a blessing. I hope that's your experience. Now the next part, actually before we go on, I want to uh, also include it's, it's, it's such a beautiful expression of this principle. It's in Genesis chapter 3. And of course, the book of Genesis, when you look at it, it uh, contains stories, motifs, illustrations that go throughout all the Bible. And in Genesis chapter 3 is where we have the story of the original fall. Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. They fled in shame and guilt, hid themselves in the garden. But God came in search of them. And he acknowledged the fact that they had sinned, but he had a solution for them. And he gave promises that... Uh, put hope in their hearts that someday things would be restored despite their mistakes. Then he did something else. You remember when they, when they sinned? It says they realized their nakedness. Now, what are we to understand from that? Well, the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. And the Bible tells us in Psalm 104 that God clothes himself with light as a garment. So if that's how God clothes himself with light as a garment, and Adam and Eve were made in the image, the likeness of God, we, we can reasonably understand that they had a, had a garment of light originally before sin. But that was lost. That faded when transgression came. And now 
they realize their nakedness and along with that comes shame and fear. But God had an answer for that, didn't he? In chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 21, it says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made, let's keep part of the verse, the Lord God made tunics, clothing, of skin and clothed them. The Lord God made a tunic of skin. Now, if it was made of skin, what does that mean? Well, that means that an animal had to give up its life. And that's exactly what happened. That was the very first sacrifice that took place. It was an illustration of what would happen some 4,000 years later when Jesus died on the cross but uh, as the Lamb of God. But uh, we don't know what kind of animal it was that lost its life in that episode, but uh, through the death of that animal, it says the Lord God made, this was something that was God's doing, the Lord God made a clothing that covered their nakedness. And throughout the entire Bible, this idea then of, of the righteousness of Christ being clothing that we can wear, that we can put on, is something that is threaded through the scriptures. So the very first thing that we see in the, in the uh, story of how God is going to bring restoration and healing uh, to the problems that exist because of sin and Satan is that he bequeaths, he confers a noble birth. And that's illustrated in the fact that Daniel and his friends were king's descendants. Let's go to the second one. And this begins the section in which we're going to find how God changes us. Point number one was how God saves us. Point number two through nine is going to illustrate how God changes us. When he saves us, Yes, we come to in our filthy rags or our moral nakedness, but he doesn't leave us like that. He begins immediately to come into our life and effect changes uh, to bring into our mind and to our actions uh, things that, that reveal his character and his love. He wants to make us like Jesus. You remember in Genesis chapter 1, uh, that was the original expression of God's mission statement. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And he did that. Adam and Eve demonstrated, exhibited the character, the form of, uh, of their maker. But that was largely lost through sin. And through the depravity and the bad choices that humanity has made, the image of God has been obscured and, and blurred and almost effaced completely from mankind, like a coin that has been uh, trampled in the dust so that you can't see the, the image of George Washington or whoever it is on it. But God wants to bring restoration. He wants to bring back the image and likeness of his character in humanity. So points number two through nine, those eight points that we're going to look at here, are all in that category. First he saved us, now he's going to change us. He imputed righteousness to us, now he's going to impart it. Now when we consider these eight points, how God changes us to become like him, never for one moment think that, that our character, our behavior in this process is going to be what merits salvation for us. Not at all. They are only ways by, we, by, by which God can exhibit his glory through us. They don't earn salvation for us. They just testify that God is at work in our life. And we're better off because whatever God brings into our life is a blessing for us and for others. But it's not through our converted good works that we earn salvation. Not at all. Only the blood of Jesus saves us. Always keep that in mind. But nevertheless, God wants to bring changes into our life so that we can become like Christ. So let's take a look at that as we find it here in Daniel chapter 1. <clears throat> Numbers 2 and 3 kind of go together. It says that the, in, in the qualities as it expressed what Daniel and his, and his friends were like, it says that Daniel and his friends, uh, it says that they were ones with no blemish, and they were good-looking. No blemish and good-looking. Those are the two terms that we're going to start with uh, as we continue our, our study here. We'll just touch the surface of that today. We'll have to continue in our next time. But let's begin by this. Let's think about what it means. Now, God is a lover of beauty. God is the one who originated symmetry and design and those facets that, uh, that are attractive to us. In the, in the Bible, there is a phrase... And we don't mean this to be a class in Hebrew by any, mean, by any means. But there is a phrase that if, uh, you, you might find helpful to learn. We're going to use this phrase many, many times in this part of, part of our discussion. And it's only three syllables long. And it's tov mare. Tov mare. I hope I'm coming close to pronouncing it correctly. 
Tov mara. What does that mean? Tov means good. And mara means appearance. So in the Bible, it might translate it as good looking or of good appearance or something like that. But we find that, that uh, there were many individuals in the Bible who were, who were spoken of as being good looking or of good, good appearance. That these two words together are used to express uh, and describe them. Tov mara of good appearance. So who are the, some of the ones in this list that, uh, that are given that description? Well, we find that Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, who were they? They were the wives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All three of them, it says, were tov mara, of good appearance, good looking. It says that Joseph and David were tov mara. They were good looking. Bathsheba was tov mara, as were Absalom. Tamar, Solomon, and Esther. Now, physical beauty is a wonderful and an amazing thing. Uh, what is it that makes something attractive? Uh, you know, during the Middle Ages, there was somebody by the name of Fibonacci, and he studied this quite, quite intently. And uh, he, he came up with a, a formula, a ratio, uh, which... Uh, people today call the golden mean or the golden ratio, and that is 1.618. 1, 1. 1.618. What, what, what does that mean? What does that pertain to? Well, this is a rectangle, you might say, that is not a square. That would be where the sides, all dimensions are equal. And it's not a double square. It's something in between that in between being a square and a double square. And he found that in nature, that those things that, that conformed to that formula, that ratio, were things that were found to be pleasant to look at and beautiful. So he studied pine cones and the spirals on pine cones and the spirals on pineapples. And he studied flowers and their configuration and, and many things in nature. And he found that so often that ratio of 1.618 would be the measurement of how those things were put together. And going back into ancient times, the more he studied it, he found that the ancient architects, the designers of the Parthenon and other buildings of renown employed that same ratio. So next time we're gonna continue our discussion on, on the matter of physical beauty and how, how important in the spiritual sense it is for us to be tov mare of good appearance. I hope you'll join us the next time as we continue our study on a little book open here on Loma Linda Broadcasting Network.